of such no show up. No worries at all. Uh, probably uh, the kids who have joined in today will be able to like go and speak about it. And hopefully we'll have more members in the coming times. No worries at all. No worries at all. Let's get started. Sure. Uh, I'll just uh, introduce a little bit, though I did not realize we had people in the house in the, asking about your second name. So a very good morning to all of you. And uh, I really uh, thank Arjun and his team for taking out time and uh, putting everything together in a very, very short notice. And uh, the reason being that I was wanting it to happen during the summer break so that the kids would have enough time to sit back, learn and ponder and maybe have questions. So they have put together a couple of sessions for us and uh, let's see what they have in store for us. I would also like to welcome uh, Veena Solaki. She happens to be a parent and one of our board members and she comes from the science background, which is physics and maths. So she, uh, I'm sure, will be able to uh, pitch in wherever you would have any language issues. So she would have a little hang of the language, uh, the subject as well. So welcome, Veena, ma'am. We have a couple of teachers also with us. And the students who have uh, decided to log in, I'm sure there's a lot there's, uh, on your mind that you want to learn, and you would have definitely have a lot of questions. So I'm going to hand it over to Arjun and Arjun, introduce yourself to us, your company, what to do, and please take a hand. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much for the opportunity again. Let me share my screen and then we can get started from there. Can everyone see my screen? Ma'am, can you uh, see the screen? Yes, we can. Sure. So good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Arjun Vijayanarayanan. I am an aviation aerospace professional. And today's topic is applications of algebra and biology in the aerospace industry. So a little bit about Adhyapan before we get started. Um, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Adhyapan. Adhyapan is an inclusive ecosystem where educators, industry experts, entrepreneurs have a unified vision of complementing educators or teachers' pedagogical initiatives uh, by providing real-life application-based education and career pathways-based education uh, and we try to nurture young, young budding minds like yourselves across India with sparking curiosity and giving you the awareness about application-based learning and career pathways. So our offerings include industry application-based learning, activity-based learning, career pathways, whether it's within and beyond STEAM, just science, technology, engineering, arts and math, and life skills. So a bit about me, um, I have been in the aviation aerospace industry for over a, a decade now. And uh, most of my job has been with working on VVIP aircraft, whether it's the um, president of the United States aircraft, prime minister of India aircraft, uh, king of Saudi Arabia, Mexican presidents, etc. So I have been um, 
in the VVIP or the business aviation aircraft sector most of my life. Um, so I've worked as an aircraft system integration and design engineer. And what that means is uh, you guys can use the chat option. You know, I'll be asking some questions to you guys and uh, I would love for you guys to interact. So on the chat, chat option, um, do you guys believe that, you know, the picture on your right is indeed an aircraft interior because it looks like a seven star hotel? You guys can start you know, uh, typing in in the chat option and let's keep this interactive going forward. Nikhil, is the chat open for everyone? Arjun, I think uh, we'll take some time to get warmed up. Yes, no. To open up. So uh, don't get offended when kids don't reply because they're, oh, yes, they're, they're, they're going to take a little time. No oh, worries. They're, they have started right. Yes, Good. already there. Yes, so these were aircraft that I got an opportunity to work on uh, while in the industry with Boeing, Gulfstream, and GDC techniques. And uh, my job included making sure these VVIP customers, uh, I understand what they wanted and, uh, and I have to transfer that in, in terms of a design, which can actually be approved from the Federal Aviation Administration, which approves everything that goes on the aircraft. So just like the DGCA we have in India, we have the FAA here in the US, and uh, you know this is what I used to do. So basically integrating systems within the aircraft and, and um, making sure the design is certifiable and approvable by FAA before the aircraft can get back into service. So before I left GDC Techniques, my last project was on uh, Mr. Narendra Modi's aircraft. And this was his aircraft. I, I, it was one of the most cherished experiences of my life to have a lot of training on working on a president's aircraft. It's called the Air India one. And uh, it was a beautiful experience that I had to get, you know, uh, security clearances, security trainings, etc., to make sure that I can work on, on the prime minister's aircraft or the president's aircraft for India. So currently I work as an aircraft certification and integration engineer for a company called Viasat. So we offer satellite communications. Right. At, at your guys' house, um, how many of you guys have heard about a dish TV or a dish satellite where you actually have a dish antenna pointing to the sky and through that you, you can watch TV, et cetera. Have you, do you guys, have you guys seen dish antennas? Yes, Kush. So aircraft works the same way. We have an aircraft, uh, we have an antenna on the aircraft that talks to the satellite and the satellite talks to the ground. Uh, and that's how communication happens, right? So whenever you fly in an airline, you guys can have phone calls, you guys can you know, stream Netflix or stream movies, et cetera. And how does this all happen, right? There are two, two kinds of ways this happen. One is an air to ground system where the antenna talks directly to the ground system, which is the gateway, like you see on the picture. And then the other kind of communication happens through the satellite. So I work for uh, Biosat, which offers satellite communications, whether it's for aircraft, for ships, for um, air force, army, et cetera. So anywhere you see, you know, an army person stuck or an air, you know, an air force person stuck, they can actually make phone calls through satellites, through the satellite, uh, you know, satellite communication systems. Now that we are talking about satellite, um, just put in your um, guess on how many satellites do you think are around the earth right now, hovering around the earth right now? You guys can start guessing in the chat box. Absolutely, thousand plus. Any 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 other guesses? I'll take you guys to um, a, a beautiful website, which gives you real-time 
um, view on the number of satellites that hover around the Earth right now at this instant. As you can see, you know, um, right around the Earth, this is how much of satellite junk that we have around the Earth right now. And as you zoom out, these are all, there are about 6,000 satellites that are around the Earth right now and hovering around all kinds of uh, you know, orbits around the Earth. And if we zoom into India and right above Rajasthan right now, as you can see, you, know, you have satellites. This is the uh, NOAA, which is the weather, uh, weather application satellite for across the, across the world, actually. It predicts cyclones, sat, no, uh, hurricanes, and any kind of weather predictions. It's that satellite, and that's you know, some of the satellites hovering around Rajasthan right now. So use this app, and it's a pretty cool app, and you can see all kinds of satellites hovering around the Earth right now. So moving forward, you know, before we get into the aerospace industry, um, I would like to define what the aerospace industry is, right? So the aeronautical industry, which is the aircraft that flies in the atmosphere, like the, the, um, the aircraft that you guys fly in whenever you take an airline, and the space industry, which includes the rockets, the spacecraft, etc., put together makes the aerospace industry, right? For example, for the aeronautical industry, we have companies that, that manufactures aircraft like Airbus, like Boeing, and our own Hindustan Aeronautics Limited. And for the space industry, uh, we have our ISRO, we have NASA, we have our NAL, which is the National Aerospace Laboratories, SpaceX, uh, which is an upcoming private uh, aerospace industry, and two startup space industries in India, Bellatrix Aerospace and Agnicol is, is gaining more and more traction these days uh, by having their own aerospace products and promoting private space industry within India. So that's what aerospace industry means. So the regular aircraft plus all the rockets and spacecrafts put together makes the aerospace industry. So when we think about job roles within the industry, um, there are four categories. You have the engineering job roles. We have the non-engineering job roles, the management job roles, and um, job roles within the industry that deals with uh, medical and psychology, uh, the humanities department people, basically, and the, and the people who uh, practice medicine and, and other biological or biology-related specialities. So within the engineering industry, and I'm not going to go deep into this, but we will see that how is algebra and biology being applied within these industries, and that, that is today's topic. So let's get into today's topic. So one of the uh, job roles that we saw was the aerodynamics design and analysis engineering, and the other one is the structural design and analysis engineering. Right, so the, the picture that you see is uh, computational fluid dynamics simulation where we simulate how an aircraft goes through air and when it's going through air, what kind of reactions does the aircraft has to face, right? Uh, there is uh, friction uh, which generates pressure, which generates temperature, and we have to see how an aircraft can be designed so that any kind of drag, which means drag is slowing down the aircraft, any kind of drag can be reduced and the aircraft performance can be increased. So that's a computational fluid dynamics engineer. On the bottom, uh, you see a structural design actually being performed where uh, this is a wing loading test uh, that we perform in the factories right here. And did you guys know a wing of an aircraft can actually be um, flexed just like what you are seeing currently. You know, imagine looking at this when you guys are flying. Actually, you know, the wing of the aircraft moves a lot when we fly. Not, not this much, but you know, this is one of the one of the 
very, very important kind of engineering analysis we make to make sure the wing doesn't fall off or the body of the aircraft just doesn't break when we fly, right? So to make these calculations, just giving you an example here uh, for CFD calculations, here are all the uh, you know, equations that we use for typical CFD calculations. We need to calculate the speed of sound. We need to calculate the Mach number, which is how fast the aircraft is going, uh, temperature, pressure, velocity, right? These are typically forming the CFD calculations. So, you know, what we see as one grid here is, uh, say, for example, the point A1, which is the bottom left, and then the point A2, which is the bottom right, say we need to calculate um, velocity 2, and we know velocity 1, right? So if we, if, if imagine that you can think that A1 point is at the subsonic region, subsonic meaning uh, lesser than the speed of sound. And, you know, we have an, an engineering nozzle here. And say, for example, the A1 is at the subsonic level and, A, and A2 is at the supersonic level when the air comes out of this nozzle, right? And if we say that at the, at the subsonic level right here, you know, imagine that to be sea level. And, you know, we already know what the sea level pressure is. We already know the density of air in the sea level. Uh, we know the temperature of air in the sea level. And so um, speed of sound can be calculated using one of these formulae. And once you know the speed of sound, um, say Mach number is given to you uh, at subsonic, it should be less than one. Sonic means we are exactly at the speed of sound, which means Mach number one. And supersonic is above Mach number one, which means that you are actually traveling faster than the speed of speed of sound, right? So every, every performance design that you do, they actually tell you that, hey, I want my aircraft to go at Mach two, or I want my aircraft to go at Mach three. So you already kind of know what the Mach two is, right? So given that you already know most of these things, uh, you can actually calculate velocity too of how the air, how fast the air goes at the end of the at the end of this nozzle, right? So imagine this is just one calculation that we use per grid. So in the industry, we use millions of grids, and we have grids that simulate how air, like you know, how air passes through a specific aircraft or spacecraft, right? So instead of having just one grid, we break it down into millions of grids and calculating, you know, we know V1 and then how can I calculate V million? And probably that V million is at the end of the aircraft that you see here, right? So basically at the end of the day, what calculations we do are all linear algebraic equations, which is just AX equal to B, simple linear algebraic equations. The most famous equations that you solve in CFD is Bernoulli's equations, Euler equations, and Navier-Stokes equations. Bernoulli's equations is not, you know, it's probably an ideal life equation, so it doesn't really apply to um, real life. But when we go to Euler equations and Navier-Stokes equations, those are all just complicated versions of completely simple linear algebraic equations, AX equal to B. This is exactly the same way that finite element analysis, which is the structural analysis, this is exactly how this works too with other equations that you see for structural analysis. I have a question here, Kush. So Mach is, you know, you represent how fast an aircraft goes using Mach number. So if you know uh, Mach 1, it means that the aircraft is going at the speed of sound. Uh, at For a metric level, the speed of sound is 340.3 meters per second. And then um, here in the US, they follow the, you know, the other system, which is 761.2 uh, miles per hour for speed of sound. So if an aircraft is actually traveling at a speed of sound, we call it a sonic. Um, like, so sonic means speed of sound. Right, so that's Mach one. If it's traveling below that, usually the aircraft that you know the the general aviation aircraft 
fly below the speed of sound at Mach 0.8, Mach 0.9, etc. And then all the fighter jets, whether it's the, you know, we have the Tejas aircraft for India and all of those fighter jets can travel at Mach greater than one, meaning supersonic aircraft. So that's, that's to answer your question about Mach. And another kind of analysis and job role that you can work on is a propulsion and thermal, thermal analysis engineer. So the, the, the thing that propels the aircraft are the jet engines, and you get to work on the jet engine, right? Um, what, how hot does the jet engine get? What happens within the jet engine to make sure that you get the desired performance? All of this, again, um, come down to an AX equal to B linear algebraic equations. And, you know, you solve that over whether it's like all these matrix equations that you saw and you saw that millions of times to make sure that you get accurate results on how hot it gets um, and making sure if you understand how hot it gets, maybe you can choose materials that doesn't melt away because of the heat generated by these engines, right? So when you, you know, I've, I've actually had this experience where, um, I was at like, I don't know, at least around thousand feet away from a Delta aircraft or an, an, a general aviation aircraft that takes off. And even though I was at, you know, I was so far away, uh, the exhaust blast actually, you know, like created a hole on my shirt, uh, where, you know, at you know, one at one of the airports that I was here in, you know, so it is very, very hot, the exhaust air that comes out. And there are so much of analysis that needs to be done on how hot it gets, what can the heat do, what kind of materials you can choose to make sure that the heat doesn't melt the aircraft or have any negative impact on the aircraft. So that is a propulsion and thermal analysis engineer. Next one is one of the most important topics within the, uh, within the aerospace uh, aeronautical industry as well, is the aircraft and spacecraft control and dynamics engineer. So, you know, you, know, you, you may see that sometimes um, a pilot can just turn on an autopilot and the autopilot takes care of the flying of the aircraft and pilot sometimes has to do nothing. Right? They can go take a break or sleep for some time and come back and the autopilot can take care of it. How does the autopilot know what to do? Right? And that is where uh, control theory is being written and it's going to be programmed inside the flight management computer. So the people who write these control theory, people who work on controlling how an aircraft is controlled are the control and dynamics engineers. Say for example, you know, um, if, you, if you sit next to the wing next time you fly, right, and you look outside, you, you, can, all, you can see so many of these, you know, whether it's the ailerons or the spoilers or the flaps, coming out at various point of times, being used by the aircraft at various point of times to do certain things, right? And, and those are all called aircraft control surfaces. So if an aircraft goes up and down, we call it the pitch. If the aircraft can roll, we call it the roll axis. And if the aircraft can just rotate, it's called the yaw axis. And these three are the most important basics that you need to understand when you fly an aircraft or if you guys get a remote controlled aircraft and you play around with it. Or if you have a flight simulation software at your house and then you play around with it, that's exactly how these things work. So on top of linear algebraic equations, we use a lot of eigenvectors and eigenvalues uh, over Laplace transformations uh, and, and making sure that we understand how these control theory works. And basically at the end of the day, if you are good at eigenvalues, eigenvectors, vector algebra, matrix transformations, et cetera, you can be amazing aircraft dynamics and control engineers. So that's an aircraft example. And you know, let's see what happens on the spacecraft, right? So there are three important uh, elements for any particular satellite. Uh, and I'm gonna, again, there's gonna be some questions and I would like to see people other than Kush and Veena um, participate. And so um, let's see who answers these. So on the wings of, the, on the arms of the satellite, 
Um, how do you guys think that a satellite gets its energy from? What do you guys think? Where the satellite gets its energy from? You guys, you guys can start chatting or typing in your answers. Perfect, solar panels. So, okay, so that's one, one important element, right? So once the energy is being absorbed and developed by these solar panels, where do you think the energy is stored in the satellite? How, how is energy stored usually? Perfect, batteries. We have the same kind of batteries too on satellite. And the third important element is, do you guys see this dish antenna on the satellite right here? And so these dish antennas are used to communicate to the ground station on the ground. So we can tell the satellite what to do or what the satellite needs to do, right? So it's important that the solar panels always face the sun. It is important that the dish antenna always faces the earth so that Sun can and can Sun can make sure that these uh, solar panels can and do its job, and the satellite can always have energy, and the antenna makes sure that it communicates with the um, with the ground station on the Earth. So, in case the satellite starts to move around, say for example the 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 antenna is not facing the ground, what does it do to make sure it comes back to a, a configuration where it faces the ground again? So satellites have small thrusters called attitude thrusters. And every time an attitude thruster thinks that a satellite is not in the right configuration, meaning that the solar panels are not facing the sun and the antennas are not facing the earth, these attitude thrusters fire up and they move the satellite in a way that the, the default existing configuration, which has to be um, true, actually happens. And that is called spacecraft control and dynamics, or sometimes they call it the orbital dynamics, if you guys go into space law and space theory, etc. So if you guys are good and pay attention to your math classes and, and are good at, you know, vector algebra, matrix transformations, linear algebraic equations, quadratic equations, and all of those, these are some amazing, amazing job roles that you can do, whether it's CFD engineering, structural engineering, propulsion engineering, and one of the most important, uh, that is the aircraft and spacecraft control dynamics engineer. So before we move, move on to the applications of biology in the aerospace industry, I have, an, I have questions for you guys. Uh, what were these landmark achievements just type in your answers if you have seen this and I can tell you what these are because these are historic achievements in the aerospace industry. How many of you can tell me what this is and have you seen this on TV? All right, so this one is the space shuttle launch. Uh, space shuttle launch, uh, I'll, I'll get to the other one, Kush. So this one's the space shuttle launch. This was the first time that we had, you know, this was back in, you know, this is about 20, 30 years before. And this was an amazing, amazing landmark achievement because first time we were able to carry an aircraft on top of a spacecraft and there was actually modular designs where you had rocket boosters, a separate tank, etc. cetera. And, uh, and I'll show you and show you guys a cool thing on how this, how this uh, idea came about. So that's the space shuttle launch. Second one, how many of you guys have seen the top picture right there? So the top one is the first time these rocket boosters were able to be reused. Every time before this, you know, you see the space shuttle, you, you see these white rocket boosters on the side of the space shuttle, but they could never be reused, right? It always just dropped in the ocean after it detaches from the, from the rocket and it could never be reused. 
first time SpaceX came with a reusable design and this was amazing you know I've, I've had the opportunity to see all these launches when I was in Florida and uh, first time ever reusable rockets are coming into existence and that's why that was historic. Uh, yes Jitendra that's the SpaceX landing. Let's do the third one. What is the third one? Uh, somebody spoke about it already and this just happened a few months ago. So this was historic too, because this was the first time we were able to land a rover on Mars. NASA was able to land a, a rover on Mars. And that was actually a Mars rover. That's right, Veena. That was actually a, a drone on the rover. The drone was called Ingenuity. And this was the first time where an autonomous aircraft mission happened in Mars. This has never happened before. And did you guys know that the name for this rover, whether it was Perseverance rover or the Curiosity rover, which was launched before, and the helicopter that was attached to this rover called the Ingenuity, do you guys know that the names for these rovers were actually given by students like you around the world and not from NASA engineers? Right? You guys can actually take part in NASA contests that they do all, all, around the, all around the year and take part in these contests. And maybe one of you guys can name the rover for their next launch. So all of these names, NASA always asks through a contest from the students all across the globe. So all the students from the globe can actually participate in these competitions and name these things. And hopefully your name would be selected. All right, the fourth one. What, what do you guys think that is? The fourth one. Any, any guesses at all? So the fourth one is the perfect uh, Mangilal, that's amazing. Not many you know, people know a lot about what NASA does and they don't know uh, much about what Indian Space Research Organization does. So this would have been, had it been a successful launch, this would have been the, the rover launch on, or launched on Chandrayaan-2, right? Um, it was a landmark, would have been a landmark achievement in India. Nevertheless, it was a great achievement from India to make sure that we actually landed, uh, uh, landed a, not exactly a rover, but then, you know, we had the uh, pod that we had landed on the moon. Even though, you know, uh, we are not able to find this pod right now, but just the fact that we are able to land it was a landmark achievement for India. And hopefully next time with Chandrayaan-3, also in the cards, you know, we will be able to have this Vikram rover uh, on, on the surface of the moon, basically. So great answers there, guys. So on to the next segment on how people who study biology are interested in zoology, medicine, biotech, um, botany, how can they have some applications also in the aerospace industry, right? So the image on your right is pretty straightforward, uh, whether it was, you know, we need medical professionals for treating, uh, med like treating injured Air Force people, uh, army folks, etc. So every Air Force base will always have an Air Force medic uh, or a medical professional always on duty to make sure that you know they are able to attend to the injured soldiers. The picture on your left, just like how you have functioning hospitals inside a building, a hospital building, you actually have a functioning hospital on the aircraft as well. So every time we have in uh, a VVIP aircraft, even on the aircraft that I worked on for, uh, for our Prime Minister Narendra Modi, every VVIP aircraft usually has a functioning hospital in case something goes wrong with one of the dignitaries or one of the VVIP or anyone 
traveling on the aircraft. So there is always an, a medical professional on the aircraft and they can work on a fully functional hospital inside an aircraft. So that's one application for the industry. Right. Second applications, the figure on your left is actually radish plant glowing, uh, growing on the International Space Station. So people who are, you know, we need to understand, hey, can food be grown in space? Uh, can food be grown on Mars to make sure that we understand how life works, how gravity works, how, you know, growing organisms works, etc. So if you are interested in botany or zoology, there are so much of research going on on the International Space Station um, about all of these kind of plant life and animal life and making sure that, that we understand space more and more and we understand other uh, atmospheres around Mars or around Neptune more and more, right? So that's another uh, important application that people who study biology can still work in the aerospace industry uh, and get the best of both worlds. The third one, um, where do you guys think that these astronauts are having a great time at? They are some days they, they are inside somewhere. Where do you guys think they are inside? Anyone? Perfect. So that's the International Space Station that they are inside. You know, as you can see, people react differently when there is no gravity. You know, you cannot stand, you cannot sit, you need to make sure you're always floating. And if you need to be in a constant place, you need to be actually tied to a rope to make sure that you are on a constant, right? So there are so many kinds of analysis that needs to understand how body responds in space, right? Does the blood flow happen the normal way like you are on the earth? Uh, what kind of food we can eat uh, when people are in space? What kind of food, how does a body react to the food in the International Space Station when it's like microgravity or no gravity, et cetera, right? So there are so much of research that needs to be done on how humans react, how human body responds to microgravity or no gravity even at some points, right? Some of these astronauts are there on this International Space Station for over one year. And so that means that their, that their entire body clock, the entire body process, uh, their sleep patterns, their, their exercise patterns, everything is altered because they have only been in a microgravity atmosphere, right? So people need to understand how body reacts. And again, people who understand anatomy, how human body works, Etc. Those are completely, uh, you know, those are the professionals that can also be an astronaut in the future. Most of the astronauts, you know, there is always one astronaut in the International Space Station who is also a doctor. And if you guys, you know, are interested in this and also interested in the aerospace sector, you know, that's some kind of specialty that you guys can think of future in, in your career going forward. There are you know, many astronauts from India having their trainings. And, and if you have the right passion, you guys can be the next ones as well. Again, astronauts, right? So the first picture was what you saw of astronauts inside the International Space Station. Now this slide talks about astronauts outside of the International Space Station, literally hanging in, in, in space, right? It, just like how you repair your car, how you repair your bike, the International Space Station also needs to be repaired because sometimes an, you know, an asteroid may hit it. Sometimes you know, things can just, you know, because of friction and because of you know, not anything, right? Repairs need to be done on the International Space Station as well. So astronauts actually tie themselves and go outside to make sure that they actually work on these international space stations. How do they train for this? There are actually facilities underwater. Uh, we have a facility, you know, um, I have seen 
facility in Florida underwater, because as much when they go underwater, now you talk about a different kind of pressure underwater, you have a different kind of temperature underwater, your body starts to act differently underwater. So astronauts train underwater. And when they do train, there are so many medical professionals tracking many different things that an astronaut is going through, through artificial intelligence, through machine learning, etc., to make sure that an astronaut is okay, right? So underwater training is how astronauts train for when they have to be in space, whenever it is they, get, they go into space, right? So these days because of developments in artificial intelligence and machine learning there may be probes stuck on the astronaut's body and while he or she is underneath water or while he or she is in space real time doctors can actually you know doctors and professionals can actually track what is going on in the body like is the astronaut's heart performing okay is the astronaut's kidneys performing okay etc and people need to be completely ex an expert on understanding human body and how human processes work right another example of uh, people who choose the biology stream you know you guys are in, in class 10 right now when you guys go to class 11 and 12 if you do choose the biology stream this is an option that you can choose if you want to be in the associated in the space industry or the aerospace industry right so we have seen that you know i just spoke about machine learning i spoke about biology and i spoke about aerospace engineering so this is a good segue into when you go to the industry, you need to be an expert in a few different things, right? If you are just an expert on biology and don't know much about the space industry, then you have to train yourself to understand more and more about the space industry, right? In the industry, many, many job roles come together to make the industry perform, right? As an example, um, there are so many aircraft that have been designed because we saw it from nature, right? The picture on your left is not even a joke. Uh, Airbus has actually um, launched this bird concept. It just completely looks like a bird. And if there are no people who understand how birds work, how birds body works, etc. Again, people need to be understanding instead of human anatomy, you need to understand animal anatomy and help us aerospace engineers design the next generation kind of aircraft, right? And, and the middle picture is actually a B2 bomber. It is a stealth aircraft. And, you know, this was actually coming from, uh, uh, the, it's a hawk, basically, it's called the yeah, it's called the peregrine. And this is actually the fastest bird when it actually goes down. The peregrine can be actually is the fastest bird. And the, the S2 or the B2 bomber was actually designed based on how the peregrine flies. I, sh I showed you guys the, the space shuttle design, right? You, have, you had an aircraft over an aircraft. And that idea actually came from two seagulls. Right. They saw two seagulls, one seagull sitting on top of another seagull while flying. And, 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 and that's where a good, you know, somebody's curiosity was triggered. And then they came up with an aircraft over an aircraft concept to make sure that, you know, even that works. So everything is being observed from nature. So we have somebody who understands design we have who somebody who understands biology and how you know birds bodies works etc and then these two people come together in a role called biomechanics or biomimicking making sure that hey an aircraft design is actually mimicked from the bird right so apart from these there are some really really cool innovations that has happened now as you can see the bottom picture just looks exactly like a bird Right, people actually use these um, unmanned systems, if you will, or these, it's called a bionic bird. So people actually use bionic bird to act as a spy, 
right? If people, if this bird exactly looks like a real bird, then we can send this to an ed enemy territory and actually monitor what the enemy does because no one can really, un no one can uh, you know, differentiate between a real bird and a bionic bird. We have, as you know, we even have honeybees that, that has been mimicked and being used for spy activities. Honeybee, you can't even tell the difference between a real life honeybee and a small honeybee, but these are all things that countries use to make sure they, they have intelligence understandings from other countries, right? Again, this is called biomechanics. And the other one uh, that in, uh, example that I can give you is the biofeedback modeling, right? So when, a, uh, this can be a car, this can be an aircraft, when a human being hits the brake or when a human being or a pilot hits certain, you know, uh, certain uh, controls at an aircraft, how does a body react, right? And so that's called a biofeedback modeling. Again, you are biology experts, medical experts, biotechnology experts, bio, you know, biomechanics expert, but you use that in the space industry. And these days there are so much more applications because ultimately we want our astronauts, our soldiers, our Air Force soldiers, and everyone to be safe and they, you know, make sure that they are comfortable, right? So just aerospace engineering design cannot do the trick. We actually need people who understand biology, people who understand psychology, human factors, um, to make sure that we have all your help to design a system which is comfortable for the users. Right, so with all that being said, uh, can you guys tell me this is actually the last slide? Can you guys tell me how many job roles come into picture here? Right. So this was a concept that was developed for a post COVID world, making so meaning that people have to be separate from one another and how that separation needs to happen is actually being designed by a user experience engineer. So, what kind of job roles do you think comes into designing this? Just give me one or two examples. Uh, what do you guys think? Anyone? Engineering for sure. There are people involved, and you know you have. And I told you that this was a post-COVID world, so a lot of health aspects need to be uh, understood. So, what other people were involved in this design? No, we had to understand how people respond to people sitting next to each other, right? Then there were, so those, you know, we had to involve psychology experts. We needed to involve human factors as experts. We needed to involve interior designers who actually come up with these things. We had to involve design engineers and, you know, uh, other mechanical engineers, electrical engineers. And uh, at the end of the day, you know, hey, what pressure should be, maintained in the aircraft, what temperature should be maintained in the aircraft, etc. Because, and again, there you need people who understands human body and, and how humans respond to different, you know, when an aircraft is at, at different altitudes, etc. Right. So putting together an aircraft or a spacecraft is not just an engineering thing. You have engineers, you have interior designers, you have biology experts, you have sales and marketing people, you have, you know, um, like I said, people who do uh, carpentry, people who work with leather, upholstery. So many people come together to make an aircraft and a spacecraft happen. And that's where you see the applications of whether it's algebra, biology, computer science, you name it. Everything has a part to play in the aviation and the aerospace industry. 
So thank you guys for the opportunity. And if you guys have any Q questions, do let me know. You can actually unmute yourself and ask me a question if you do have a question. Hi, Arjun. I would like uh, you to tell our kids that how did you reach that pinnacle, that point where you are right now, so that they can like pursue their interest in uh, in aerospace industry. Yes, ma'am. Um, so after I finished my mechanical engineering, so I'm a mechanical engineering graduate in the undergraduate. I, I pursued two masters of science degrees. One was in aerospace engineering and one was in human factors and systems. And so I had a background in mechanical design and I proceeded to complement that background with uh, aerospace engineering and human factors and systems. Because I understood that, uh, or I was taught that, hey, finally, all the engineers are designing these systems for humans to use. So you need to understand the user perspective and you need to understand the human perspective, right? Even the chair that you guys can sit on, if the chair is not comfortable, then you're not gonna buy it, right? So that's an ergonomic design. Ergonomics is what is involved and that's a form of human factors as well, right? So that is something that I thought was very, very useful for me. And so I did another master's of science degree in human factors and systems. And it's actually becoming a, a very important stream to study these days. And I, I would highly suggest you guys to look at it as well. So once I had, a, a well-rounded education uh, from engineering and from the human factor studies, then you know I've, I've been fortunate enough to work completely in the aviation and the aerospace field, right? One thing that I would, I would uh, advise you guys is make sure you understand the basics, right? Whether it's algebra that you're learning right now, whether it's calculus that you guys may be learning, any subject, science, math, social science, you know, language, it doesn't matter. Everything actually comes to help when you go into the industry in some way, shape or form, right? So right now, that's what you guys have to focus on to study well and understand the basics, right? And once in, you know, once you are in class 11, class 12, uh, or even now, I would love for you guys to get understanding about different careers here in the next five days uh, or in the next you know, five sessions that Adhyapan is going to offer you. you now, it's not a sales pitch, but Adhyapan is going to tell you about different careers, whether it is earthquake engineering, which I personally have never heard about, whether it is careers in aviation or real life applications of mathematics and science. Make sure you understand real life applications of everything that you're learning and not just learn things in a you know LHS equal to RHS hence proved kind of a way. Ask questions in your classrooms. Te your teachers are gonna be so happy when you ask questions and because it's gonna tell them that you are interested and you're actually trying to understand these questions, right? So that's application oriented education was, it helped me a lot. And you also need to see that if you can do hands-on education, right? Um, is it can be as simple as making a paper plane. There is actually a competition in this, in this world called the paper plane competition. And people compete to see how far, how far their paper planes can go. You know, there is actually world records being created on people who create the best paper plane, which can travel as long as it can. Because at the end of the day, by doing these things, you are applying principles that you learn from physics, principles that you learn from, you know, aviation principles, etc., and put them into real life applications, right? So that's something that I would really suggest to you guys. So career awareness, real life application based, and I think these two put together will, will automatically help you with understanding where you need to go, whatever your passion is, right? It doesn't have to be aerospace, whatever your passion is, as long as you know what the real reality is for that particular industry, 
and you are able to know your basics, right? You will do really well in your career going forward. I hope I answered the question. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Actually, when I was a kid, I was quite fascinated and dazzled by the enchanted by the sky. And I actually wanted to uh, go into, you know, aeronautics and all. But uh, somehow, maybe the passion was lacking or I don't know what. And now you have uh, rightfully ignited those sparks again. So thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. You know, my, my passion was actually kindled in seventh grade. Uh, my aunt took me to an exhibition. Uh, and that's where I first got to know space and aerospace and everything, et cetera. And ever since it has been a great passion for me and, and I still love what I do. So uh, if there is no more questions, we guys, we, we can finish the session. Uh, let me know if you have any question. I can wait for another minute or two. If not, we can finish the session. Uh, all right, I guess there is no other questions from anyone. If there is anything, we'll definitely share it with you and uh, we'll get back to the students. Uh, yes, sir. For now, uh, ma'am has uh, lost the connection uh, and she's not able to join in again. So she's uh, apologized for that. And uh, thank you for bringing up this uh, session. I'm sure many of our students will take a uh, great learning from uh, this and will definitely go towards this career paths. Uh, to all the students, uh, we have more uh, webinars uh, coming on uh, career science, maths uh, in this coming four or five days. So make sure as soon as we share all the details, kindly join in time. Thank you. Thank you, Arjun, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you for this offer. And we will see you guys in our next session. You guys have a good day. Thank you, guys. Thank you, sir.